All right, everyone, I want to talk to you guys about the people of Kiev voting to name a street after a Nazi collaborator and murderer by the name of Vladimir Kubuyovich. Kubuyovich was a Ukrainian Nazi collaborator who was one of the key founders of the SS Galatian Division. The SS Galatian Division were mass murderers, they were marauders, thieves, just absolute scum. And Kubiovich was one of the founders of their division. And the people of Kiev voted in favor of naming a street after this monster. So what does that tell you <laughs> about Ukraine? What does that tell you about Kiev? Kiev, like much of Ukraine, has a Nazi problem. Further evincing that Vladimir Putin was correct that Ukraine has a Nazi problem and needs to be, and I know this is going to sound so just belligerent and, and insensitive, but Ukraine needs to be denazified. It does. So this was a story that almost, I don't want to say it almost escaped the news because it did make the news, but to a very, very small extent, uh, this was a story that very few people read about and knew about. This happened uh, this month, actually, this month. Uh, the Kievan City Council made the proposal to name a street and it put out three candidates, one of whom was Vladimir Kubojovic. And the city gave the people of Kiev the ability to vote for who they wanted the street to be named after uh, by using their phones. They could vote on their phones. So 31% of those Kievans who voted, voted to name the street after Vladimir Kubuyovich. So 31% of Kiev thinks that, thinks that Kubuyovich was a hero, praises this guy as a hero. That's pretty bad. That's like, that's like saying, you know, 31% uh, of uh, Berlin loves Hitler. That's pretty problematic. And if 31% of people in Berlin voted to name a street Adolf Hitler Street, uh, the whole world would be talking about it. I would imagine so. And I would imagine that uh, people in Germany wouldn't be uh, too happy about that, right? Because it would just look really bad for Germany. So apparently, people who are pro-Ukraine don't think that this looks bad for Ukraine. And they were about to name this street after Volodymyr Kubuyovich. And the ambassador, the Israeli ambassador, intervened and spoke with the mayor of Kiev, Mr. Klitschko, and told them, look, this is not going to look good for Ukraine. Don't do this. And Klitschko rescinded the decision, even though it was made by a majority of the voters. He rescinded the decision to name the street uh, Kubiovich Street. It's a little bit difficult sometimes to pronounce these names because they use a J and a Y, and I'm just not used to this sort of spelling. Anyway, so this story really goes to show that Kiev has a serious Nazi problem, and it's a microcosm for Ukraine, generally speaking. Uh, of course, much of eastern Ukraine hates these historical figures and hates the cult for these historical figures, doesn't like the reverence for Bandera or Shukhovich. But of course, uh, there's a lot of people in Ukraine who do follow this historical cult, uh, especially in Western Ukraine. So this is uh, something that truly reflects the spiritual, ideological state of the country. Not all of it, but generally speaking, it does indicate a serious internal problem within the society. People in Poland know this, uh, and a lot of people in Ukraine know this. 
So I want to read to you guys uh, some more details about this. And I want I really want to emphasize on Kubiovich. I want to talk about this guy just to show you what kind of monster he was. And I'm going to read an article from my phone. This was published by I-24, I-24 News. And it talks about this. And it says here, Kubiovich played a key role in the formation of the Waffen-SS Galatian and publicly announced his willingness to to take up arms and fight for the Nazi cause. Okay, it can't get clearer than that. It can't get clearer than that, that this guy was no damn good. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Okay, he played a role in the formation of the Waffen SS Galatian. Waffen SS Galatian Division took part alongside with the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, in the butchering of ethnic Poles and Jews because they wanted a Ukrainian state, a free, independent Ukrainian state free of Jews and Poles. So it says here that Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko intervened to prevent the Kiev City Council from naming a street in honor of a Nazi collaborator and an SS official following a complaint by Israeli Ambassador Michael Brodsky. According to Ukrainian Jewish Committee Director Edward Dolinsky, a street in the Ukrainian capital was set to be renamed after Volodymyr Kubuyevich, according to a motion adopted by the city council. During the Holocaust, Kubuyevich was heavily involved in the formation of the Waffen-SS Galatian, a Nazi military force composed of Ukrainian volunteers. The names suggested... This phone is acting crazy. Um... The name, the name suggested by the Historical Commission were submitted by the City Council to a public vote on the Kiev Municipality digital application where voting will be open, etc., etc. The option of renaming the street in honor of Kubuyevich has so far won a majority of the votes with 31% in favor, while the second and third most popular options have received only 18% and 10% of the votes. Before the Holocaust hap began, Kubuyevich was a staunch supporter of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUNM, which means that he followed the faction of the OUN that was led by Andrei Melnik, who was also a mass murderer who took part in the slaughter of Polish people. And in April 1941, he demanded the creation of an autonomous state within Ukraine, in which Poles and Jews would not be allowed to live. So there you go. Polish people, Polish people who love Ukraine, Polish people who are very, very pro-Ukraine, what do you have to say about this? Because I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of love from Polish people. Really, I have. I mean, at one point in time, back in 2018, I had a YouTube channel with an audience that was like 98% from Poland. No joke, because I was talking a lot about Poland at that time, and I'm still talking about Poland. I've been fascinated with Poland ever since, probably ever since 2014, 2015, around there. Um, but at the same time, you know, after Russia invaded Ukraine, I started getting a lot of hatred from Polish people. Polish people calling me an idiot, saying that I don't know what I'm talking about. Those sorts of uh, insults. Those sorts of acrimonious comments. And they said these things about me because I simply said, listen, Poland, uh, it's obvious that you are allying with Ukraine for geopolitical reasons because you damn well know that... Ukraine is a country that glorifies people who butchered your people. It's as simple as that. And I want to read to you guys about one of the atrocities that was uh, committed by this uh, SS Galatia. This is the, the Nazi division that was founded partially by Kubuyevich. It was also founded by a major Catholic leader in the Ukrainian Catholic Church. His name was Joseph Sippy, or sorry, Joseph Slippy. And I know I'm not pronouncing that name correctly, but I do prefer to say Slippy because this guy sure as hell slipped through the cracks. Because after the Second World War, the Soviets put him in a prison. They put him in a Soviet prison 
Soviet prison camp. And, and you know, the typical uh, way of talking when it comes to these Soviet prison camps. Oh, he was in a Soviet prison camp, so therefore he was a victim and he was a martyr and he was persecuted and he was this poor guy who was fighting for righteousness, who was oppressed by the evil Soviets. But it turns out that Joseph Slippy, regardless of him being this clergyman, helped form the Waffen-SS Galatian, which, by the way, was an all-Catholic Ukrainian division. So there weren't any Eastern Orthodox people in that division. It was all Catholics, Ukrainian Catholics. And uh, Slippy uh, was... He he was his him being in prison really uh, angered a lot of people because they saw him as a great man, and it made some people very anxious. And the Vatican got involved, and they begged the Soviets to release him. And the American government intervened, and they also begged the Soviets to release him. And the Soviets released him, and he ended up taking part in Vatican II. So go figure. A Nazi was in Vatican II. For all of you traditional Catholics out there who hate Vatican II, here is another uh, detail that you can use to, uh, to go against Vatican II. So, so the next time you are just expressing your anger against Vatican II, you can bring this up. This guy sure as hell slipped through the cracks. He was definitely Slippy. The name Slippy suits him better than the correct pronunciation of his last name. Uh, but one of the atrocities that was done by the Waffen SS Galatia, and this is something that Polish people would know, was the Huta Pianyaka Massacre. Huta Pianyaka Massacre. And here is an account that was uh, written by Wikipedia. And it says here that Filomena Franczkowska, who was 20, so this was one of the few survivors... Uh, Huta Pianyaka was a village that doesn't exist today, uh, but at that time it was uh, it was part of Poland. But then, where it is now, where it would be today if it still existed, would be in um, in Ukraine. And it was a small town with a population of around a thousand people. So really, it was a village, small village. And the Ukrainian nationalists, members of the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and also fighters from the Waffen SS Galatian, they went into this town and they butchered almost entirely everybody. Okay? Almost everybody they killed. Uh, and there were only a few survivors left. So Filomena Franchkovska was one of the few survivors. And it says here, uh, Filomena Franchkovska, who was 20 then and is the oldest still living survivor of the massacre as of April 2008, stated in the Gazeta Porska article that the Ukrainians came to the village at 4 a.m. They entered Huta Pianyaka from the nearby village of Zorkov and began shooting at everybody. Her father had been beaten before being executed. And one of the attackers said loudly in Ukrainian, now you have your Poland and your Ukraine. Well, what does that mean? If I had to guess, they were referencing the fact that the Polish government at the time was in exile because Poland was a territory of the Third Reich, and this government in exile was headquartered in England. So I'm guessing, if I had to guess, that's what this, this murderer meant. Now you have your Poland and your England. Franczkowska lost both parents and three younger siblings in the massacre. Only her brother survived. She said that the murderers deliberately did not kill two twin boys aged four and were laughing at the children who were trying to wake up their dead mother. Yeah, that, that, that really hits hard. Franchkovska, together with her brother and a group of people, was ordered to go to a barn which was locked and set on fire. It's just like a scene from Come and See. It's just like a scene from Come and See. Guys, if you have not seen the movie, Come and See, uh, for one, I highly, highly recommend it. You have to see this film. It is, it, there's, a, there's a scene in this movie where a massacre is done, and it is the most, it's the most realistic scene that I've, of, a, of, a, of a massacre that was done in the Holocaust that I've seen in a film. It's so, I've never seen a film that portrayed a Holocaust massacre so accurately as the one in Come and See. It, it, it's so graphic, it hits you right in the soul. 
But they do this very thing in the film. They put them all in the barn and they light them all on fire. She somehow managed to open the rear door and escape to a forest. Quote, this is from uh, Franchukovska. This is from her. She says, now they say they do not know who did it, who did the massacre. But it is enough to visit neighboring Ukrainian villages. One can still see remnants of the stolen property. The locals remember this event. And this is why none of them has settled in Huta Pianyaka since then. The village was completely abandoned. Nobody ever moved back to this village. And many years later, decades later, Polish people went to where Huta Pianyaka used to be and they put a memorial and the Ukrainians came and tore it down. Why would they tear it down? Why? I'll tell you why. It's because Ukraine has a Nazi problem. It has an ultranationalist problem. It really is that simple, everyone. It really is that simple. Things truly are that black and white. When you look at something as obvious as this, when you see people in Ukraine wanting to rename streets after Nazi collabor collaborators, when you see Nazi collaborators who are hailed as heroes today, when you look at all this reality, it's so obvious what the issue is. It's so obvious that there is a far-right, ultra-nationalist sentiment that goes deep within Ukraine. And the people who want to confuse you, and they want to deceive you, and they want to convince you, to persuade you that this is not the case, they will always say, well, it's not that black and white. No, it really is that black and white. And when they want to push their agenda... When they want to push their assertions, all of a sudden what they have to say is black and white, and it is that black and white in their minds. And that's always how deceivers work. Um, anyway, there is something else that I want to read to you guys in regards to this uh, Kubiovich guy. Kubiovich. I'm not sure if I'm even... I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Kubiovich. Whatever. Uh, this is also regarding Kubiovich's Waffen SS Galatian and what they did in Huta Pianyaka. This is from a book that I read last year, a great book, Poland's Holocaust. Let me see if the camera is getting this. Poland's Holocaust by Tadeusz Petrovsky. Very good book. I've actually tried to contact Petrovsky and he never, never responds to his email, I guess. I don't know. It's very hard to find him online. Uh, but this guy is an academic from Poland. He lives in the U.S., I believe. And he wrote this book. Uh, excellent read if you want to learn about the Ukrainian uh, reign of terror that was done against the Polish people. So here is an eyewitness account from someone who survived the Huta Pianyaka massacre. His name uh, is, who is uh, Vladislav Bakowski. And he wrote a letter to the Polish parliament. Polish Sam, Sam, I don't know how I'm, Sam, I'm not pronouncing that correct, I don't know, anyway, he wrote, Vladislav Bakowski wrote, I come from Huta Pianyaka, on February 28th, 1944, the population of Huta Pianyaka was murdered and the village burned, on that day, among others, my parents were killed, on that day, over 1,000 residents of the village were murdered in an inhumane manner, not all could be identified, most of them were burned alive. That atrocity was committed by the soldiers and officers of the SS Galatian and the Ukrainian nationalist of the OUNUPA. And then there's something else from this book that I want to share with you guys regarding Kubiovich, because Petrovsky has written um, some things about Kubiovich. And he writes here, according to Kubiovich himself... So, so, rewinding a little bit here, Kubiovich helped found, alongside the Germans, the Ukrainian Central Committee. And this was supposed to be an autonomous Ukrainian state under the Germans, and the idea was to have an ethnically pure Ukrainian state without Jews or Polish people. And that's why they killed Polish people. See, people can say, oh, they just, they just want to name a street after this guy. Oh, they just want to name a street after It's not a big deal. Oh, it's just a, it's a historical figure. It's a historical figure. Okay. All right, smart guy. 
Let's say Germany never fully got denazified. And let's say that the old Germans never learned their lesson from World War II and they taught their kids to revere Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler became a national hero in Germany. And in comes the Cold War, and the Americans need to use the Germans. And this is what happened during the Cold War. The Americans used the Germans. They worked with the Germans uh, as a proxy against the Soviet Union. This is why West Germany had such a very well-armed... Well, West Germany had a very large military force during the Cold War. It's because the Americans needed them or wanted to use them as a proxy against the uh, Soviets. So let's say so, so let's say in in the context of the Cold War that Hitler was still uh was a national hero because the Germans never uh they never really learned their lesson and they ended up loving Hitler. And let's say in this hypothetical event that uh even though the Germans revere uh, Adolf Hitler, the Americans uh, say, uh, well, we need to use them anyway, even though they're Nazis, even though they love Hitler, even though they worship this guy who started this war in which millions died, we still need to use the Germans. Would all of you smart asses out there be arguing, well, it's just a historical figure. I mean, it's just a historical figure. And, and yeah, he did bad things, but, they, but, but, but that's not how the Germans see him. They see him as a hero who fought the Soviets. So this way of thinking is exactly what's being applied in all of the defense for Ukraine. People are saying the Ukrainians see people like Kuboyovich and they see Bandera and Shuhovich and Mel Melnik. They simply see these guys as heroes who fought the Soviets. It's harmless, blah, 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 blah. Well, let's say in a hypothetical world, Hitler is a, is a national hero in Germany. And Russia has invaded Ukraine, and we need to use the Germans as a proxy against Russia. Would you be okay with applying the same logic to Adolf Hitler? And I, and I know you're going to have all these edgy people online say, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But I would like, I'm, I'm not even... Forget those people. Forget those edge lords, right? I would like to see the people in CNN, people in mainstream media outlets, applying this logic to Hitler. Let's see if that ever would happen. And let's see if anybody would really answer this argument honestly. So Kubojovic, he helped create this, this Ukrainian committee and it says here, according to Kubiovich himself, the committee was on the payroll of the Abwehr. This was a, a unit of the Nazis. It was essentially a German organized OUNM enterprise, which functioned in the, in the GG and after 1942 in eastern Galatia until the Soviet counteroffensive. On March 8, 1943, Kubiovich contacted Hans Frank, the general governor, with the proposition of establishing a voluntary Ukrainian military unit that would fight alongside the Third Reich. Frank promptly contacted his subordinate, Otto Wachta, the Golite uh, of Galatia, who contacted Himmler, head of the SS, who gave his consent on March 28, 1943. I wrote to Governor Vakta on April 8th, stated Kubuyevich, and informed him that our community was ready and well disposed to the formation of the Galatian Division. So these Ukrainian fighters who, who, uh, who were a part of the uh, Waffen SS Galatian, they had to make a vow. They had to make a declaration of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. And this is what they said, quote, I swear by God this sacred oath that in the struggle against Bolshevism, will give an unconditional will give unconditional obedience to the supreme commander of the German Wehrmacht Adolf Hitler and that as a courageous soldier I will always be prepared to give my life for this oath. And Mr. Kubiovich helped found all that evil. All that 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 entire sinister group, the Waffen SS Galatian was founded to a great extent by Volodymyr Kubojovich. And 
many Ukrainians see him as a hero. And you're going to have the neocons and you're going to have the neoliberals arguing, well, he's just an historical figure. They see him as a hero. Who cares? All right. So if Germany uh, sees uh, uh, Hitler as an historical uh, figure and a hero, would you uh, be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine, too? Would you give a pass to Hitler? Nobody in the mainstream world is going to give a pass to Hitler, at least not right now. That may change in the future. Maybe in the future we'll be seeing uh, Hitler's face in the in the new uh, uh, currency for Germany. Maybe that'll happen. It wouldn't be that surprising because I know that I know that Germany loves to give this uh, this impression that they are completely different and they love democracy and they're all for freedom and all this stuff. But I know that underneath it all. Underneath this veneer of being pro-democracy, there is definitely a sentiment lingering about in the political atmosphere of that country, in the cultural atmosphere, in the soul of that country, lingering about a love for Adolf Hitler and a desire to revive the Reich. Not saying all Germans, but I'm saying that they are Germans who are this way. And there's probably a lot more of them than people would like to think. So let's say one day in the future, Germany says, you know what? Hitler was a European hero. He did some atrocities. Okay, well, you know what? So did Julius Caesar. And nobody cares if somebody says that they like Julius Caesar. Uh, you know, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte is a national hero in France. A lot of French people revere Bonaparte. Uh, a lot of French people revere Rob Spear. And Rob Spear was a mass murderer. Uh, a lot of French people... Look at the historical figures of, of, of France. Look at the historical f heroes of France. A lot of them were mass murderers. They were rebels and they were uh, revolutionaries who committed atrocities. They were involved in what mass killing people through the guillotines. Uh, and they're historical uh, heroes in French uh, culture. So why can't Germany have Hitler as their uh, historical hero? Why can't they have... Uh, uh, Goring or Himmler or Goebbels as historical heroes. Why not? I mean, I could one day see Germans making th this very sort of argument. Maybe that'll happen. And if it does happen, you'll watch all of these sycophants living in America will say, oh, yeah, that's no big deal. And he's just, yeah, you know. That's the past is the past. That's their historical hero. They want to uh, use him to make a face for Germany, to to further uh, solidify German identity, to make a declaration of German identity. That's fine. You know, we have to use this sort of sentiment. Uh, we have to use this sort of uh, cultural zeal uh, as a way to uh, stoke up, you know, national uh, interest to fight against Russia. So why not? Who cares? None of that would be surprising. If that ever were to happen, it wouldn't shock me in the least. Why? Because look at what's happening in Ukraine, everybody. Look at how the sycophants back Ukraine. Same logic. That's why fascism can definitely revive. Fascism will never revive. Nazism will never revive. No, it can definitely revive. All you need to do is... All that needs to happen is some sort of a catastrophe that's so dramatic, so intense, so so serious that emotional, political, cultural provocateurs and manipulators can simply come about, appear, and say, let's do this one thing that prior to this catastrophe from taking place, would have been considered unthinkable. Let's praise this ideology. Let's bring back this old ideology that was taboo prior to this happening, but now we need to use it to stoke up the flames of frenzy, political frenzy, whatever it may be, against this enemy to fix this catastrophe up. It can definitely happen, everyone. It can definitely happen. Now, besides Volodymyr Kubuyovich, there is another national hero uh, whose name was made into a street. Uh, but unlike Kubuyovich, his name being put on a street wasn't canceled. 
So Kubiovic, they wanted to make his name into a street name. That got canceled because Israel got involved. But there was an, another name of a Nazi collaborator that did have uh, a street named after him very recently. And this was Ula Samchuk. Ula Samchuk was another uh, collaborator and a murderer who uh, loved, 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 loved the fact that Jews were being murdered, that Polish people were being murdered, and he stoked up the flames of murderous hatred, and he encouraged the eradication of Polish people and Jews. So here is a report from a Ukrainian newspaper called Vercherny, and this is, uh, if you want to know the website, vercherny.kiev.ua. This was written on April 17th of this year. And it says here, recently the Kiev, the Kiev City Council, I'm skipping words here, the Kiev City Council renamed a number of city toponyms, the names of which are associated with the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation and its satellites. So here's the thing. Because there is a war going on between Ukraine and Russia, the Ukrainians have been working to rename streets. They want to rename streets because those streets were named after Soviet figures. Well, they don't like that, so they want to rename them into. Uh, they want to rename them after Ukrainian uh, historical heroes. So there was a street that was named after Alexander Stolyatov. Stolyatov was a famous Russian physicist, and he was also a professor of Moscow University. Ukrainians, they wanted to change, they wanted to get rid of this guy's name because, you know, he was Russian and Russians are open season now. Uh, they wanted to uh, remove his name and replace his name with that of Ula Samchuk. So, okay. This is crazy, guys. So I said Soviet figures, and that's true. They do want to de-Sovietize, if I can, you know, if I can use that term loosely. They want to de-Sovietize uh, certain things in you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, infrastructure. But this guy wasn't even Soviet. This guy wasn't even Soviet. Alexander Stolyatov was Russian. He was born in 1839 and died in 1896. He was a famous physicist. Not even Soviet. Not even Soviet. So people say, oh, it's against the Soviet Union because Soviet Union was an evil empire. Communism is evil. This guy wasn't Soviet. He was Russia. So it's not just a hatred towards the Soviet Union. It's a hatred towards Russians. Russians are open season We've seen this in the Baltics. For example, last year in May, Russians gathered on May 9th to commemorate the Soviet victory over the fascist. This is something that Russians have been doing in the Baltics for decades. And they celebrate the fact that the Soviets were victorious over the Nazis. And they have their memorials. In uh, Riga, the uh, the capital of Latvia, last year, uh, a bunch of Russians gathered together and they put flowers on a memorial to commemorate the Soviet victory over the Nazis. Well, this angered the nationalists in Latvia and the nationalists said, well, why aren't, there, why aren't the police dispersing the crowd? They should be chasing them out. Blah, 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 blah. Why aren't they dispersing them away? They, why aren't they arresting people? And they were angry at the police and the pressure was so intense that the, that the interior minister of Latvia was fired. And somebody came and grabbed all the flowers that these Russians laid out and threw them in the trash. This pissed off the Russians so much that on May 10th, the next day, they went back to this city square. They went back to this memorial and they said, we're going to do another commemoration. And this time the police, because of all the pressure that was put on them, dispersed the crowd. That's considered okay because they're Russians. So they don't like... It's not, it's not just de-Sovietization, it's also de-Russification. So now it's okay to hate Russians. 
So they want to, so what they did was they removed the name of Alexander Stolyatov from this street and they replaced it with a mass murdering Nazi. Well, isn't that nice? So imagine you have a street named after a physicist who wasn't a murderer, he wasn't evil, he was just a physicist, he was a professor. Get rid of his name and replace it with the name of a Nazi mass murderer. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of all of the craziness that we've been seeing in this country, the United States, in the last recent years against statues. Remember? Well, th there's a statue of George Washington, and we have to get rid of it because Washington had slaves. There's a statue here of, name your historical figure, get rid of it. They had the same thing go going on in England. Statue of uh, Winston Churchill. Get rid of it. Why? Because oh, Ch Churchill was a racist or whatever. And they they ignore the good thing, the the, the good actions that those people had 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 done. And they just want to focus on the bad, and they, and they want to remove the statues. And it's like this in Ukraine, but it's against Russian figures. Well, he's Russian. Get rid of it. And the conservatives, neoconservatives, neoliberals will, will hear this and say, well, yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, well, let's get rid of monuments here. Let's remove certain street names here in America. Well, let's not do that because that's part of our history. But the Ukrainians are so, these, these particular Ukrainians, because I don't want to say all Ukrainians are this way because that wouldn't be true, but these particular Ukrainian nationalists, they're so, they're so hysterical, they're so vicious and full of vitriol that, uh, that they, re they remove the name of a, a, of a guy on a street because the guy was Russian, even though he was a physicist. And they replaced his name with the name of Ula Samchuk, who was a Nazi mass murderer. Now, let me read to you guys some things about this Ula Samchuk guy. Okay, so the, the, the physicist was bad, right? I mean, putting his name on there, that was too much because he was Russian, right? His, his crime was that he was Russian, right? So he's bad. But let's, let's replace his name with a mass murderer, what does that tell you about the about the Ukrainian nationalist culture? It's crazy. It's a bunch of lunatics. So here's from here's a, an excerpt from the Wikipedia article on Ula Samchuk. It says here, in 1941, Samchuk returned to Volyn. That's where they killed all the Poles as a member of one of the ultra nationalist organization of Ukrainian nationalists. So he was part of the OUN. No surprise there. Where during 1941-1942, he worked for the Nazis within the Reichskommissariat Ukraine as chief editor of the pro-Nazi newspaper Volen. During this time, he notably wrote of the Babin Yar massacre, quote, today is a great day for Kiev. So he praised the Babin Yar massacre, one of the worst massacres done in the Holocaust, if not the worst. And I remember Zelensky talking about Babin Yar. Oh, Babin Yar. We have Babin Yar here in Ukraine. Well, you have a street that was recently named after a guy who praised the Babin Yar massacre. On September 1st, 1941, shortly before the Babi Yar massacre, Samchuk wrote on page two of Volen, quote, the element that settled our cities, whether it is Jews or Poles who were brought here from outside Ukraine, must disappear completely from our cities, kill all the Poles, kill all the Jews. Later that month in the article, Zavoyo Vyomo Misto, let's conquer the city, Samchuk added the following, quote, all elements that reside in our city, whether they are Jews or Poles, must be eradicated. So this guy was a mass murderer. And you can see a picture from Ukraine, a statue of Ula Samchuk on a bench looking very prestigious. This is like if I were to put the statue of, of I don't know, Himmler or Goring on a bench. Let's just, it, it might as well just do it. My, Germany might as well just do that and say, you know what, America? We're going to show our true colors. We love Hitler. And let's put, uh, let's name streets after Nazi leaders. And what are you going to do about it, America? What are you going to do? Call the ADL? 
you need us against Russia. Would not shock me in the least bit if that were to happen in the future. <laughs>